Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'd like to take this time to introduce our panel. We have three uh, esteemed members joining us this evening. Um, I want to read a little bit of their bios and tell you a little bit about them before we get into the dialogue. We have Jeff Olivet. Jeff has worked in homelessness, behavioral health, and public health for more than 25 years. As a teacher, writer, and policy leader, he has shaped new directions for organizations across the U.S. and internationally. From 2010 to 2018, he was CEO of the Center for Social Innovation, now C4 Innovations, where he led the growth and development of this dynamic social policy company. Now as the head of Joe Consulting, Jeff is deeply committed to social justice, racial equality, gender equality, and inclusion for all. Welcome, Jeff. And I'm going to introduce all the panelists and then we'll get into the discussion. We also have joining us tonight, Amanda Deary. Amanda has spent over 15 years working in the nonprofit and public sector as a, <clears throat> excuse me, leader committed to racial justice, housing affordability through advocacy for system change. She's currently the CEO of Funders Together to End Homelessness, a national network of funders supporting strategic, innovative and effective solutions to homelessness. Currently, she serves as a board member of the United Philanthropy Forum and is a member of the leadership team for the National, national Racial Equality Working Group on Homelessness and Housing. As, the mem as a former co-chair of Away Home America, she also serves as an advisor to the work of ending youth and young adult homelessness rooted in racial equity. We also have joining us John A. Heath. John brings a vast background of working for elected officials as a government affairs professional. Currently, he focuses on U.S. government relations in state capitals across the U.S. and supports international business growth for Turo Inc. In 2019, he founded the National Professional Lobbyist Association, the only national organization focused on diversity and inclusion in the nation's lobbying corps. Heath has served on the staff of former Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus Chair Congressman Elijah Cummings, Mar Maryland Senator President Thomas V. Mike Miller, Maryland State Senator Clarence V. Mitchell IV, and former Maryland Governor Robert Erklich as a White House liaison. Welcome. So we're going to start tonight with you, Jeff, to understand how Black people experience homelessness at uh, a disproportionate rate. It's important to examine the many federal housing policies and practices that have created a disadvantage to racial minorities through residential segregation and redlining. Can you give a brief overview of our country's history with these practices? First of all, Antonio, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, Amanda and John, it's an honor to be with you on this panel. Um, I, I think you asked me to cover 500 years of uh, racism and oppression in, in three minutes or something, but let, let's go. Um, I, I think it's important <laughs> to, to know that um, homelessness is not new. Homelessness is not colorblind and homelessness is not accidental. And, you know, we talk a lot about redlining and I think people, even though some uh, folks in the United States just realized on uh, May 25th that we have a problem with racism, we know that it goes back well before redlining. And so I'd like to take us back briefly uh, to the, the, the earliest beginnings of racism and homelessness in the country. And when you think about the way this country as we know it now was established, it was established on the a genocidal murder of native people and the thefts of their land. So that's the starting point, right? Mm -hmm. And that was happening in the eastern part of the U.S. with English settlers, and it was happening in the southwest and up the coast of California with Spanish uh, enslavers and uh, you know people who were literally uh, killing folks and taking their land. So that's the starting point. And even though it wasn't yet enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, that's where we begin. And then you can see wave after wave of policies that create the circumstances we find today. So uh, the, the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which resulted in the Trail of Tears, and again, the, the death of hundreds of thousands of native people and the uprooting of so many millions who were literally made homeless by that federal policy. Mm -hmm. We also have to look at things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment camps, which were also examples of how the federal government passed laws that systematically excluded people of color from full citizenship, from property rights. Uh, the Japanese Americans' homes and businesses were confiscated and they were put in prison camps. Mm -hmm. We have to look at things like the, the persistent 
anti-Latino immigration policies that go back well before the last 20 years and and involve uh, oppression against Latino people uh, that goes back you know well into the 1930s and then you can carry that further back. So you you can't ignore any of those threads of the history. And then we have to look at the history of black Americans, which started as uh, chattel slavery and then moved into black codes in the South in the 1860s and 70s and Jim Crow laws, which uh, Douglas Massey calls American apartheid, you know, a system that was even after the fall of slavery uh, as racially oppressive as anything that South Africa or any other country has ever had to offer. So that's the backdrop. By the time we get to redlining in the 1930s, which became federal policy under one of the most progressive presidential administrations we've ever had in FDR, that was a racist policy that not only segregated neighborhoods, and they're still segregated, it also stripped black and brown people of the opportunity for multi-generational wealth accumulation which has ended up giving white households more of a buffer, more of an economic safety net, and created not only the, the sort of community geography of, of how we see homelessness play out today, but also uh, systematically keeping black and brown people economically suppressed generation after generation. And so when we come to the current wave of homelessness, as we know it in the last 30 or 40 years, it is no accident that people of color are way more likely than white people to become homeless. So not new, not colorblind, not accidental. You know, when you put it in that context, it really helps people understand, particularly those that are new to the education, to look at how this has been, this is the history of our nation. And I think when you look at it from the different prisms, it also helps people kind of open up their mind to, okay, well, wait a minute. I see exactly what we're talking about, finally. You know, what started with segregation and redlining, has a has exasperated the structural forces that uh, further systemic racism in employment, education, healthcare, and the criminal justice system. Can you expand a little bit on this? In Michelle Alexander's fantastic book called *The New Jim Crow*, she talks about how adaptable racism is, mm -hmm. and you know if you think about it, it it very quickly adapts to changing circumstances and. And it then pervades all of the systems. Uh, so as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said, the this, this system's not broken. The system's behaving exactly like it was designed to behave. That's a paraphrase, but, but that's what he was getting at. Um, and so if you look at any of the systems you just mentioned, those contribute to homelessness and to high rates of homelessness for people of color. But back to the fact that homelessness can easily and quickly adapt. It, I think of it sometimes... Uh, like not just any virus. We've talked about there being two pandemics going on right now, the coronavirus pandemic and the pandemic of systemic racism. But it's it's very much like the HIV virus, which quickly replicates itself and adapts and becomes treatment resistant. And that's why there is not yet a cure for HIV. And so just like that, racism can end run positive change. If you look at the backlash after the civil rights movement, if you look at the backlash after the emancipation of slaves, if you look at the backlash after the election of our first black president, uh, these are patterns that play out historically over and over and over. And so while there's no cure for racism, we have to just beat it. We have to beat it with laws. We have to beat it with policy and, pu and public pressure on our elected officials. We have to beat it with personal and institutional behavior change. That's a great segue. John, uh, one of the reasons you founded the National Black Professional Lobbyist Association was due to systemic racism in lobbyist hires. Can you share that experience and what you hope the National Black Professional Lobbyist Association achieves as the first and only national organization focused on diversity and inclusion in the nation's lobbying corps? Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm so honored to be with these uh, distinguished uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, I just want to make a slight correction. We're the only organization that's focused on uh, diversity and inclusion of black lobbyists. So there are other uh, groups, uh, such as our Latino brothers and sisters, uh, that do have a lobbyist uh, association. Uh, but our uh, organization was born out of a familiar experience for many of us. Um, I was trying to get a black lobbyist in a state uh, to be considered uh, by a tech company. Uh, mm -hmm. This individual had uh, 
clients like Apple, uh, not necessarily a small client, uh, but I could not even get this gentleman a hearing uh, to even present his qualifications. Um, for us as uh, black folk in America, with my experience working to fight discrimination uh, in uh, the C-suite and corporate arenas, public sectors, uh, this is nothing new. And so instead of us uh, uh, complaining uh, and uh, commiserating, we got together and said, hey, we need to be a solution in this time. Now, mind you, this is before any, you know, uh, George Floyd protests. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad that America now realizes that racism still exists. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad somebody else got the memo besides us. Um, but uh, this was prior to this pregnant moment that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And we saw perhaps an avenue uh, to begin to strip uh, corporate America, to strip nonprofits and others from the excuse that uh, they've used for years, well, we can't find any. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to give you the best and brightest. Uh, we're going to also focus on developing the bench of uh, that next generation of black lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about issues like homelessness and others, uh, this is not to say that every black person understands homelessness or every black person has been born into poverty, but many of us are acutely aware of some of the unique challenges in various subject matters, perhaps then our white brothers and sisters or other ethnic groups. And so we bring a unique gifting a unique passion as we advocate and lobby. And so our aim is to grow the number of black lobbyists in America, uh, not only on the corporate side, but we want to make sure that black people have an opportunity to be in these uh, law firms and corporate shops. Mm -hmm. And so we're right now having some great dialogue with tech companies. Uh, we know uh, I, I and my company and the only uh, I guess, senior black male. Uh, and so we know tech has an issue with diversity, period, and certainly with diversity as it relates to black men. Uh, we want to be able to um, really knock that uh, out of the park, uh, give them qualified black lobbyists, um, you know, and I'm, I'm partial to our sisters as well because there are unique challenges that they face in race and gender. But one of my colleagues said, well, look, you know, we need to help the brothers right now because the sisters are doing pretty good in black lobby. And <laughs> so there are these unique challenges, but we're up to the challenge. We're meeting uh, with folks in the C-suite uh, and we hope to in five years uh, really be a power player uh, in the lobbying uh, arena. Well, thank you. I want to personally thank you and your organization for your service. Um, Amanda. Finding solutions to the homeless crisis is going to take a massive public and private approach. From your perspective, what is philanthropy's role in helping to solve this issue? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, you're on mute. Click your microphone. Move your cursor over. You take your cursor and just put it over the screen. That should come. <laughs> OK, Amanda, go on while you figure that out. We'll, we'll get Erica to work with you on that. So, John, as someone who experienced homelessness, can you share your story and how your experiences influenced your chosen profession? Sure. Uh, well, uh, 1993, I was living in Tulsa uh, and really did not see a path forward there for me. Uh, wonderful people there, uh, served as assistant pastor of the Mount Zion, historic Mount Zion Baptist Church, uh, the church that now is being seen by everyone as they Google the Tulsa race riots, uh, and I served there. Uh, and so some friends said, hey, move to Maryland. You know, there's great opportunities here, so on, so on, so forth. So we moved in with some friends, uh, lived with them for a little while, uh, made sure that we provided food for the house and 
you know, uh, didn't cause any ruckus. Uh, but our dear friends put us out the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, we weren't uh, causing any kind of problems. Just I don't know what happened. Uh, and so we moved into the Knights Inn on Route 40 uh, and ran out of money. I uh, was getting a you know, small amount in unemployment and just wasn't enough to uh, pay the uh, weekly or monthly rent. And so in a, a midnight hour, uh, desperate, faith-filled uh, a call, we called People Aiding Travelers and the Homeless, and they placed us in a family shelter, the Salvation Army Booth House, 1114 North Calvert Street of Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. And you don't uh, remember clearly, if you don't forget. (laughs) I I shall never forget. And um, and so from that experience, uh, you know, I almost became the new poster child for homelessness uh, because we're so uh, used to seeing brothers and sisters on the street and uh, other folks that we would consider homeless material. Uh, But the fact is that families, uh, children uh, are the growing number of the homeless population. And so I did a whole lot of work uh, still living in the transitional housing, still living in the shelter, being an advocate uh, for my other brothers and sisters. After that, uh, I uh, then led Break the Cycle Employment Program. It was the only employment program uh, for homeless individuals in Baltimore. And uh, we literally transformed that program uh, because I was homeless. And I think one of the challenges that we have is that we have so many people making poverty policy, uh, homeless policy, who have never experienced it. Uh, And uh, I'm not knocking those who haven't, uh, but it's one thing to be theoretical. It's another thing to be experiential. Um, And so if we can marry those two things, and I think we're really cooking with grease. And so I modified that program. We had uh, what at that time was a ridiculously successful uh, uh, success rate at 90, I think, 1%. Uh, That was unheard of at that time. But when people looked at me, uh, they did not see uh, my predecessor was a young, very well-intentioned white fella Uh, but he didn't have life experience. Uh, You know, he just could afford to take the job. Uh, However, I was passionate about it uh, when uh, my participants would say, hey, you don't know what I'm talking about. Then I could tell them, oh, let me check you right there because a couple of months I was in the shelter. Uh, And so we were able to also stop pushing homeless people in dead end entry level jobs. You know, uh, we we put folks in positions where you're almost assured that they're not going to have a job uh, with any kind of wind of economic downturn. So we started placing people in law firms. I'm talking the blue blood law firms, uh, you know, secretaries, uh, uh, support staff, uh, PHH, which was a uh, wonderful um uh, transportation company. We had folks there. And so we literally transformed that paradigm. And the reason it was transformed because of my personal experience. Thank you for that. Amanda, are you there? Can we hear you now? Uh, Ira, could you mute, uh, could you go off a of video, please? I still can't hear you. Okay. Um, hopefully Erica can reach out to you and try to solve that issue. Uh, Jeff, we're at a watershed moment now, but you've dedicated your entire career to addressing systemic inequities. In 2016, you launched Spark, supporting partnerships for anti-racist communities. Can you share some of your findings? Sure. Um, the Spark initiative was started at a time when there was very little attention to structural racism in the homelessness arena. And there had been a lot of research over two or three decades that had documented very high rates of homelessness for African-Americans, Native Americans. There's a kind of mixed research literature around Latino homelessness. And we can talk about that if you'd like, because I think it's uh, over and over, it's an underestimate and an undercount for a lot of reasons. But there was very little research 
and very little community capacity building going on around this intersection of structural racism and homelessness. And so when we launched Spark in 2016, this was with a, a dynamic multiracial team of researchers, trainers, policy analysts, and, and people who are really committed now, to advancing um, do you racial have equity. Visa? And okay. what, what we did is move into eight communities to really examine this intersection of race and homelessness. And as on the research side of it, we conducted a mixed methods research study where we looked at all the numbers, we did all the quantitative number crunching, but we also collected 200 oral histories from people of color who had experienced homelessness and, and really tried to elevate those voices and those stories in our understanding of all these numbers. Why are the rates of homelessness so high in some groups and not others? Let's try to unpack that a little bit. At the same time we were doing that research, we were also deeply committed to creating change as we were doing it. So you don't wait four or five years for the research report to come out to say, yep, we sure have a problem. You get going, you know there's a problem uh, around racism and homelessness, let's get going. So we've seen a number of communities really take on action uh, even as we were doing the research and, and moving the data out. You asked about the findings. Um, we found one thing that was really interesting. We were in eight communities all over the country, uh, West Coast, Midwest, Northeast, Deep South, and we found that the patterns of overrepresentation were very similar everywhere we looked. This was true in Atlanta, San Francisco, Syracuse, Tacoma, Minneapolis, Dallas, and what we found was that Native Americans and African Americans were consistently overrepresented at a rate of three to one, up to eight and 10 to one compared to the general population. And so this was not to say that there's no white homelessness. Of course mm -hmm. there is. You go into shelters all over the US or drop in centers, we know there's white homelessness. And our work doesn't try to diminish that in any kind of way, the, the severity of that crisis. But it was to say, nobody's looking at the, the structural racism root causes that are driving large numbers of people of color into homelessness. And so in addition to that, that number crunching that I just talked about, these qualitative themes that emerged from the, the stories were really incredible. And we heard about so many barriers to housing that people of color were facing. We heard exactly what John was talking about, about the dead end jobs that people were being offered and getting. People were working a lot. They wanted to be working, they were working, but they were working jobs that didn't pay well, didn't give enough hours, didn't have benefits, and certainly didn't have any opportunity for career advancement. And so we heard that as a barrier. We also heard a lot about multi-system involvement, meaning involvement with the criminal justice system or the child welfare system or you know other, other kind of systems of care. And you could look at that and say, well, those people are really messed up. They're involved with all this other stuff. Or you could look at it and say, those systems unfairly target some groups over mm -hmm. another. So again, this becomes a, an analysis that's rooted in a structural understanding of what's going on, not an individual vulnerability understanding of what's going on. Because even when we controlled for poverty, poor white people didn't become homeless as often as poor black people did, mm -hmm. or poor native people. And so there's something else going on, and we believe that to be uh, structural racism. The last thing that we that we found that I wanted to draw attention to is we found a tremendous appetite for change. And this was true at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. Um, I, I so hope we can get Amanda's I audio guess. going because Amanda has been one of the, the most effective and vocal champions of advancing racial equity in the homelessness arena over the last few years. And when Amanda and I first started working together a few years ago, it was at this sort of pivot point where the homelessness field wasn't talking about racism at all. And if they did, they would point the finger at everybody else. It's those other systems. It's criminal justice. It's, you know, it's housing discrimination. It's education. And those are all true. But there was very little acceptance of we may be part of this problem, too, that there may be racism within the homelessness response that is actively working against people of color exiting homelessness. And we can look at things like how coordinated entry plays out that, you know, uh, this is some, some inside baseball for folks who aren't in this every day, but there are systems of, of intake and assessment and prioritizing who gets which type of housing mm -hmm. that have a, a racial overlay that privileges some groups over another. So we've got to look upstream and outside of our sector, and we also have to look at our own sector. Thank you, Jeff. Are you with us, Amanda? 
We can't hear you. I, you're showing on my screen as your microphone is blocked, is um, muted. The only thing I can suggest, and I'm no tech person, but um, maybe if you dial in on your phone, yeah. So uh, in the meantime, while you do that, uh, I'm gonna talk to John a minute about um, reform. So many believe that to reform homeless policy, it's important to have someone with lived experience in that discussion. We wouldn't argue that, right? Having lived experience and having worked on the policy side, what do you believe are some of the critical steps to help dismantle the structural inequities that lead many to homelessness? Sure, well, you know, uh, there is no uh, cookie cutter experience to homelessness. That's That's just the reality. And I think there has been some in this arena who have tried to address this with a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. For example, today, uh, because of COVID, you have people who have never been unemployed before. Um, they talked about people who got on food stamps. They talked about people who are on Medicaid. And guess what? Now they have to go through that migration. And I would remind lawmakers from uh, you know, Congress on down, nobody wants to have to deal with that. No one wants to have somebody in their business. Uh, many of these caseworkers are just rude and nasty. Mm -hmm. uh, they do not treat people as an individual. And so there has to be some level of customization uh, when we're talking about addressing these policies. In Maryland, I used to oversee homeless services uh, when I ran Community Services Administration. Uh, what a poetic story. The guy who was homeless uh, then <laughs> began to oversee homeless services. Uh, I promoted housing first because that equalizes. Um, if you have drug addiction and mental health issues, you can get a house. But if you're just a person who lost their job, the biggest impediment is housing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're telling people to get right to get housed. Oftentimes you need to get housed so you can get right. So I think there's something that uh, really we have to uh, invest in uh, those multi-pronged approaches, uh, certainly involving people who have been homeless. And if I can, if I could address something, two things Jeff brought about, which I think was brilliant that we don't really talk about. Uh, Jeff talked about white homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, when I worked for the governor of Maryland, uh, I reminded him uh, in jest, but in uh, in full seriousness as well, uh, that uh, he was an affirmative action uh, case. Uh, he was a white kid from the other side of the tracks who, because he had athletic prowess, was able to go to one of the most prestigious uh, all-male prep schools, subsequently to Princeton, and then Wake Forest Law, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I said to him is I said, the difference between you and I, and this is almost the same even with the homeless population, is that a white homeless person given a haircut, uh, if they got teeth issues, we take them to the dentist, they got some good teeth, they got a haircut, uh, they have got new clothes, and if they modify their speech, they are treated much more differently than those black brothers and sisters who do the same thing, right? Uh, yes. so, so that's clear. And then also Jeff raised this issue about system integration. So when I was in Texas, Department of Health and Human Services, their center uh, uh, talked about, hey, let's now have system coordination, right? Those of us who have been in the service community talks about busting silos and all that kind of stuff. When I was assistant chief of juvenile probation at Dallas County, uh, we understood that there was a unique relationship with, with these kids who are in the juvenile justice system, who are also in the CPS system, in the child welfare uh, system. So, but we found out we weren't talking. So there was no coordinated approach to help these young people who oftentimes, if we don't help them, are the next generation of homelessness. Mm -hmm. So we used the Georgetown model, uh, had that co-current approach. Uh, that's something I'm incredibly proud of because now we were able to not only address the child's issues, but most importantly, address the parents' issues. And what we also found is many of those folks in our systems had experienced homelessness themselves. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, I am a firm advocate, uh, certainly as, as a person who's lived homelessness, not just once, but a couple of times, uh, mm -hmm. to have individuals who have been homeless be participants and help chart the course. Uh, but also, we have to understand that there is no uh, cookie cutter approach mm -hmm. to addressing this. We've got to understand that folks are coming at this uh, from different experiences. Uh, what about that lady who's uh, fleeing domestic violence? She's mm -hmm. got a unique set of uh, uh, challenges that we have to help her navigate through. Of course. And so we can't look at this uh, with one lens. We have to have multiple lenses on how we deal with homelessness. Thank you. Amanda? Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, I can hear you. Here we go, everyone. <laughs> well, so, the work of racial justice is being persistent. So right. here we are. That's right. I appreciate it. So yeah, um, thank you, everyone. So I'll just I know you asked me about philanthropy's role, and I, I think it's really important to name um, that our structures, including philanthropy, all of our structures, but especially philanthropy, are so rooted in white supremacy culture. And we have to name that philanthropy has largely made its wealth off the backs of stolen land um, and chattel slavery. So we have a lot of work to do as philanthropy. Um, but I, the work of funders now, and especially our members at Funders Together, is realizing uh, that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. And we have to confront the reality that the housing movement has really been putting window dressing on the master's house um, when it comes to being anti-racist and when it comes to the work of uh, disrupting power and disrupting uh, gatekeepers. So philanthropy has a really important role in uprooting some of uh, this, this work. But I want to emphasize it's not just philanthropy, it's anyone who has power, anyone who is a gatekeeper to resources. I think philanthropy has an, uh, an enormous amount of power. Um, and so, you know, we really focus on what does it mean to give up power? What does it mean to center people with lived expertise? I'm sure while I was gone figuring out tech issues, I heard some of the conversation around centering people with lived expertise, but often philanthropy brings people with lived expertise to the table with a folding chair, not with a permanent chair. And, we're, and the system is guilty of that too. So how do we give real power over to people of color, especially black and indigenous folks? Uh, so they are part of decision-making, they are part of grant-making, they are deciding about resource allocation. And how do we really think and dismantle about every part of the system that are gatekeepers to resources, and dismantle that, liberate that. Uh, finally, I, would, I, I just want to emphasize that we often talk about housing as this issue of parity or housing as this issue of charity. And what we're really talking about is housing justice. How do we repair uh, the inequities that Jeff spoke about in a way that allows um, people who have been historically marginalized uh, to have housing justice. And what I mean by housing justice is not you get to live in the place that you can most afford because we have not addressed the deep seated issues in our housing crisis, but how do we ensure that people get to live where they want to live and co-create the community that they want to create um, and have the stability that they need that is not given to them by any power structure, but because of their own resources and their own liberation. Um, that was a mouthful, Amanda. We waited. Well, for, I, I, I had to make up for the time that I wasn't able to talk. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So funders together to end homelessness recently changed this mission to use a racial equity lens to support members and the philanthropic sector to shift its practice policy and grant making actions to foster greater diversity, equity and inclusion as an organization. What are some of the policies and systems your organization has been advocating for through this lens? And I know you touched on a little bit there, but uh, can you share some more? Yeah, well, I, I did touch on, on our big priorities. I think right now we're at a moment where we're, we're thinking about what 
we can't advocate for those policies alone. Philanthropy's role is to support and resource, resource uh, folks with lived expertise to be informing us of the policies mm -hmm. uh, that we should be advocating for. So our job as philanthropy is really to um, step up and step back when needed and create the environment with our resources so that can actually happen. And to um, incentivize uh, through authentic collaboration that our systems, our community organizations um, start to listen to organizations, communities that are not part, usually not part of the mainstream system. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about here. There, are, when I think about the inequities that we're seeing in community, we know that philanthropy doesn't resource the organizations that know when someone is first experiencing a housing crisis, that knows um, how to work with people in a, in a way that's just and kind and caring. So we're primarily funding mainstream organizations that are huge gatekeepers to, to real justice. And so we have to advocate within philanthropy to start to unpack some of that and say, who are we funding? How do we fund black and brown led organizations? How do we change the mainstream system to be more representative? And, but that's not enough. We know that diversity and inclusion is not enough. How do we give the resources for, for organizations to start to unpack their own policies and procedures to understand um, how to be anti-racist. Anti you know, when we talk about these issues of inequities, et cetera, people go, oh, okay, here we go again. And what oftentimes we don't talk about, we heard a whole history from Jeff of everything that has gone wrong and all the horrible things has been done since the inception, but we sometimes don't get to hear about the progress. And I think sometimes also people become less defensive when we're able to share some of the progress. So you've spent uh, over 15 years, Amanda, working in nonprofit and public sector as a leader, committed to racial justice and housing affordability through advocacy, advocacy for systemic change. What progress have you seen in that time and what do you hope to see in the next 15 years? Well, I think the progress is that the homelessness movement, as Jeff alluded to, was talking about structural racism before a few weeks ago. Were a majority of organizations putting out statements that said Black Lives Matter? No. <laughs> uh, but Jeff and I are uh, leaders of the National Racial Equity Working Group on Homelessness and Housing. We're over 30 organizations uh, for the last year, two years, Jeff, have made a deep commitment of their time, of their value statement to say, we're going to center racial equity. We're going to start to look inward and outward. That's progress because I've been doing this work for 15 years. My colleague, Jeff, is slightly older than me, a little bit longer. And we know that we weren't having these conversations. We weren't talking about being anti-racist. Communities weren't doing the work to put together committees and structures to examine their disproportionality in their systems. Philanthropy certainly wasn't naming structural racism. And to me, that is progress. Um, the conversation, the analyzing our racialized history to know how we got here is definitely progress. I think some of us saw that progress speed up in the last few weeks and we're struggling with how we keep that momentum that doesn't just get to say Black Lives Matter when we see two Black men lynched publicly. How do we keep up the momentum that recognizes this is not new, um, that this has been here? Thank you for that, Amanda. And, and you sharing that progress, I think, also offers a spark of inspiration probably for some of our listeners um, to see that this is hard work, it's long work, but there is progress, there's a long way to go. And as they ponder, how do they get involved? We are going to take some questions in a moment, but before I do that, I do want to give each of you an opportunity to weigh in on my next question, which I'll pose to each to you collectively. And that is, how do we turn this awareness into action? Whoever wants to go first. I'll John, defer. we'll start with you, yeah. Uh, well, I was gonna defer to my distinguished panelists, uh, and uh, I'm so glad uh, that uh, my dear sister got her mic <laughs> because 
that she, was a would have been a missed opportunity. It would it not. She blessed me beyond measure. So thank you, Amanda, very much uh, for these nuggets. I, I'm going to use that folding chair real good in these next couple of sessions. <laughs> God. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it really uh, is incumbent upon all of us to work to support Jeff, to support Amanda and other colleagues in raising this. I think in the past, we've almost been penalized for saying that there's differential treatment. Uh, and so now it's to the point where um, I, I'm just at this place uh, where I, I'm not really worried about making anybody uncomfortable anymore. Uh, I was on a call where uh, a wonderful gentleman uh, happened to be a uh, uh, someone that I interacted with years ago, didn't even know it, you know, how, you know, circles are so small. Um, uh, older white fellow who talked about this idea of people being under, uncomfortable with the term systemic racism or they don't understand. I, you know, I'm, I've am i been uncomfortable my whole life. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was integrated into a public school system being called the N-word. Uh, every day. Uh, I've been run out of Coyle, Oklahoma by the Klan. Uh, I've experienced enough racism in my life uh, that I'm acutely aware of what my four children have to deal with, uh, not only in just a life, but certainly in the public square and in professional arenas. And so I, I think it's us coming together, mobilizing, supporting those who are up front with time, talent, and money, uh, to push forward this understanding that not only does race have a place in policing or in employment practices, unfortunately, race is ever present and racism as it relates to housing and homelessness. And I think when we get serious about that, uh, when we're pushing forward, supporting Jeff and Amanda in whatever way we can, uh, I'll certainly uh, be the first to say, hey, I'm here uh, to support your efforts. And uh, I think that's when we have a shift of the conversation and then we have policies that reflect that, that can lift all tides. Thank you. I'll try to get a word in here as a, as a white ally and a recovering CEO. I've worked very hard, not always trying to have the first word or the last word. So I'm happy to speak right between <laughs> John and Amanda on this one. Um, uh, you, you asked about the, the, how we turn the awareness into action. And part of it, I think, is uh, honing how we understand racism, and part of it is how we use our spheres of influence. So these are two things I'd like to leave with folks. Um, around our, our understanding of racism, if we think racism is one bad apple, if we think racism is that person who uses the N-word, if we think racism is, uh, I can say now, former officer Michael Piner in Wilmington, North Carolina, who was fired this afternoon after a very racist uh, recording uh, came to light, he and two of his fellow officers. If we think that that's all that racism is, then we're missing a fundamental piece of the analysis, which is, of course, that's racism. And of course, that kind of um, individual level racist bigot is is probably always going to be with us. But we're missing out on an analysis of what's going on within our institutions and within our larger society. And so you have to understand these levels of racism that inter interact with each other. So when you look at the, the killing of George Floyd, those officers um, are exhibiting racist behavior within a larger racist police department. And we know that because uh, the the officer who murdered George Floyd with the, his full weight on Mr. Floyd's neck had been written up 18 times and nothing happened. So he's oper and he was a training officer, by the way. So in that moment, he's teaching these younger officers how to behave in this environment. So they are working within an organization that needs to be totally uh, rethought, reformed, reborn. And that police department is operating in the larger societal structures of a criminal justice system and immense uh, bias against black people. So you have to understand racism at all those levels, and then you have to dismantle it at all those levels. And so when we think about our own spheres of influence, we can certainly 
change our hearts and minds. We can do work on ourselves as white people, black people, brown people, any any race, any background. We probably all have work to do and we need to do that. We can change the circles in which we run, our faith communities, our families, our uh, our organizations, our teams, no matter your position. You don't have to be a CEO to change your institution. You change it with whatever power you have and you seize more power than you think you have because you probably have a lot more, more that's untapped. And then we try to harness all of that towards a larger societal change. So it's the analysis of, of what racism is and how it behaves. And it's our full commitment to using every one of our spheres of influence, every bit of our power, every bit of our intellect and heart and spirituality and social connections to create the kind of society that we want to live in together. Amanda, I'll give you the final word on that. Yeah, so ditto to what my colleagues have said. If you've heard me speak before, you've heard me say that these things and they're still true, even though we're in, I think, an uprising in a different moment. Um, we first have to uh, develop a racial equity and racial justice analysis. Just because I'm black doesn't mean that I have that. I have the lived expertise of racism, but that doesn't mean I have a racial equity and racial justice analysis. I had to work to get that. I had to teach myself my own racialized history because it wasn't taught to me. And so if I didn't know that, think about how much folks don't know. So it has to start there. We have to sit and live in the tension of the racialized history of our country, number one. And I think we have to um, uproot the whole system. I've been thinking a lot about this. And I often also say we have this layer cake of racism. We try to put these new policies on top of bad cake like, or try to put frosting on top of old bad cake and think that it's gonna be sweet and good. And what we realize is we actually haven't uprooted anything or, or strive to be anti-racist because we're just creating this layer cake of racism. So we have to uproot the whole system. We have to uproot the, the nonprofit industrial complex that allows us to continue to operate and think that our work can be done in these containers, that racial equity work can be put to this as a committee, it can be a task force. No, it has to be at the center of all we do. So like I said this earlier today to a colleague, like give up your strategic plans, give up your fundraising plans, give up your financial planning. None of that matters if you are not putting every single discretionary resource and dollar to be an anti-racist organization. And that includes funders supporting that. Your strategic plan doesn't matter. Your fundraising plan doesn't matter if you are not uprooting every single policy in your organization to be anti-racist. And that's where you begin to sustain this work. And we need to go on a hiatus for doing business as usual and start to uh, uproot ourselves, um, dismantle these systems and really start over again. Very beautifully put. So we're gonna move into a Q and A. So if anyone has a question, please type it in the speech bubble and then um, our esteemed Jet will manage the questions for us. So Jet, and I want to thank each of you. This has been a lovely discussion and I feel honored to have been able to hear from each of you and all the wisdom you shared and on behalf of all of our listeners. I, I, there's so much there to really take in and for one to find their place in, in the process from wherever they are. So thank you so much. Antonio, thank you for hosting such a fantastic panel and really Jeff, Amanda, John, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, my name is Jet Doy and I'm the Vice President of Development and Advancement at Skid Row Housing Trust. And our first question is, how does systemic racism in the justice system contribute to homelessness? Well, uh, as a, a former uh, assistant chief of probation, I think I can speak to that a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, the, the fact that uh, so many folks uh, are incarcerated unjustly, uh, even unfortunately for crimes they did not commit. Uh, and then there is no transitional kind of aspect that's uniform around the country. And so what you find is when brothers and sisters are released, 
they don't have those family support systems. They don't have those things that others rely on. And then subsequently, those folks then now are thrust into the homeless service system. Uh, and so uh, I've worked, let's say, in Harris County to address that when I worked for the county judge and to create those bridges uh, so that we could get folks housed uh, coming out of jail or prison, for that matter, at the state side, um, and then avert those homeless experiences by making uh, these opportunities to be housed. Um, and I think that's one of the unintended consequences of our justice system and something that uh, I think everyone wants to be justice to be so punitive. But the fact is folks are coming home. And so how do we create a system that helps them navigate, uh, become successful, uh, do legal things, as opposed to having to do illegal things uh, to survive. And I would just add to that, that um, it's a two way street between homelessness and, and jail and prison. There are so many people and uh, disproportionately people of color who are incarcerated and upon exit, they are uh, stamped with a scarlet F for felon that uh, you know after someone has done their time it's still impossible to get a job to get housing uh, and and we've got so many rules and regulations set up as well as landlord bias employer discrimination etc that makes it nearly impossible for someone with a felony history uh, which often came by way of unethical plea bargaining but that's a whole other uh, webinar we can do sometime um, that that you're, you're creating the circumstances in which this person is going to be at risk for homelessness from here on out and then because we criminalize homelessness, we essentially make it illegal in many cities to sleep, camp, use the bathroom outside, do things outside that in any of our homes would not be illegal to have a beer when this session's done if I want to. If I did that in the park, it's illegal. I start getting charges piled up against me. I end up in court, um, unable to pay, end up, end up incarcerated. Like these things happen in these very complicated spirals and they always happen disproportionately to people of color um, and so the way that the the racist criminal justice system plays into homelessness is it creates a draw from homelessness into incarceration and it creates a flow of, of black and brown people from jail and prison straight into homelessness thanks both of you for that um I think actually, Amanda, this next question is a terrific one for you specifically. Um, as we move toward action, um, how do we help case managers, social workers better serve black and brown people experiencing homelessness with multi-system involvement? So often I hear case managers say their clients have too many barriers to house when what I see is that they're victims of systemic racism from many systems. Well, I would just respect say that I think that's the wrong question. I think that I, I understand the intent of the question and I know that the intent is good, but I think we're asking the wrong question. Um, I don't think that it, we can say that it's, it's the case manager's fault or it's only job. The case manager is operating within a system that reinforces um, those biases and those beliefs. And, and sometimes rewards those biases and beliefs and reinforces those policies by what we measure, right, in terms of outcomes. And so I think the question should be, what are the system changes that we, we can do internally and externally to um, prepare the folks who are working within organizations, who are working within systems, to have the resources, to have the belief that they can tear down those barriers? And what are the policies that organizations should be advocating for that tear down those barriers? Um, and then that all has to be done by centering people with lived expertise to be a part of that process, um, to work alongside in real ways with real power in, in doing that. So um, I think that's the, right, that's the right question to ask or a question that will get us to the outcome we're trying to seek. And Antonio, if, if I may, um, that is one of my biggest pet peeves 
uh, as a former caseworker, I saw that with many of my colleagues. And uh, go back to break the cycle employment program. Uh, we had people who had gaps, right? We had people who had been imprisoned. We had every kind of negative kind of factor that you could place on a person. But what we did is we focused them on the achievable goal that most folks thought was unachievable. Um, I recall the general manager of the Hyatt Hotel would always say, you know, I try to trip your people up, but they never trip up. Uh, fine, okay, you were locked up, or, or maybe you were drug addicted, but you were living with your grandmother. So we're not gonna talk about you were addicted for 10 years. We're gonna talk about how you devoted time to care for your grandmother, and now you're looking now to re-enter the workforce. We saw folks who uh, were able to get jobs that the system said they couldn't get. Uh, they started living in homes and having lifestyles that many people, caseworkers in the system, said they'd never achieve. And so there's got to be a shifting of the, mo uh, of the mentality of many of the caseworkers to understand that there are these barriers, but those barriers are not uh, barriers that can't be overcome with uh, some artful uh, and uh, innovative uh, kind of case management, uh, and then helping that person frame a story that now they're not looked as a liability, but they're now a person that people want to invest in with opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks for that, John. John, that was fantastic. Um, thank you. I, the next question is also for you. Um, what role can our faith play in overcoming systemic racism? Well, they asked the right uh, question to a preacher. <laughs> uh, I tell people faith is the only thing that got me through. Uh, when uh, there were obstacles, when uh, I had some people who were very helpful, other people who were not, uh, I understood that there was a God that still sat high and looked low. Uh, and that if I could be persistent, uh, walk in faith, uh, and you have to understand my, my testimony is one I was in a homeless shelter in 1993. By 1996, I was in regular trips to the Clinton White House. Uh, so you can't tell me what faith cannot do. Uh, and so we understand that, you know, we have people from different thought processes. Uh, you have, you know, our atheists and agnostic brothers and sisters, people who are Christians, Buddhists, or Muslims. Uh, but for my experience and many of, uh, of, of those who have journeyed through homelessness, it was faith that allowed us to come through. Uh, and as Antonio said, uh, it is that faith that causes me not to forget. Uh, it, it is that faith that causes me always when I'm able to engage in this arena, to engage with the full force and every piece of veracity I have uh, because somebody did it for me and I wanna do it for somebody else. Um, and, you know, like Dr. King said, if I can help somebody, if I travel along, uh, if I can share somebody with a word or a song, then my living's not in vain. And so faith is critical uh, for many of us as we try to climb our way out of the grip of homelessness. And Antonio, if I could just add um, to that, uh, hard to follow, John, but uh, I'm reminded that Jesus flipped over the money changers tables in the temple and Jesus challenged the political authorities, and Jesus was not okay with injustice uh, for anyone, but especially for the poor and the oppressed and people of other races. If you if you follow the, the social justice thread in Christianity, in Judaism, in Buddhism, in Islam, there is a deep undergirding, I think, in deep down in all of us that longs for justice, that longs for equality, uh, and, and that can really ground all of our work, whether we espouse any of those faiths or none at all there i believe is a deep human desire for justice a deep human desire for connection thank you jet do we have other questions we do as a matter of fact we have so many other questions um i know we had <laughs> promised our panelists that we would keep it to 15 minutes over um but everyone is really excited to talk to you guys um, 
Amanda, I think this question is perfect for you. How do nonprofits that create homeless housing collaborate with organizations and individuals in this group to share how we can add value to address this need? Hmm, I'm, I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, uh, collaborate, you mean in this group, like folks that are on this panel or uh, folks that are just in the meeting? I, I, not, I'm not, I'm not I, clear on I, I inferred from the question um, that the the audience member is referring specifically to the three of you. You are pretty dazzling. Oh. Um, okay. And Antonio does happen to work for a housing developer, so I don't think that <laughs> the question was for him. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I I, I feel like uh, particularly for Jeff and I, we've been on this tour for a really long time, and well, it feels like a long time, but many others are starting to also lead within their communities and nationally in the work of racial justice. Um, so I know there's, um, we have colleagues of ours that deeply are trying to lead this work um, that are available to speak to your organization, your communities. It's not just Jeff and I, there's uh, colleagues like Mont Jones, there's colleagues like Britt Manzo, there's colleagues like Jessica Venegas. I mean, there's the list goes on and on of folks who are deeply rooted in the work of racial justice. I think it's um, important to, to think about who are speaking to your organization, to think about um, how you can be in community, in your own community, to understand who are the, the folks within your own community that have also been doing this work. And when I speak around the country, it's inevitable that someone will come up to me after a panel or a keynote and say, I've been saying this for a long time, but no one heard me. I'm, I've, been do, I've been looking at the data for a long time. So Jeff and I are, are no real experts. We're, you know, we're, we're, we might be dazzling just because um, we have some uh, energy right now, but the experts are in your community. And they've been seeing the numbers they've been seeing the policies for a long time connect with them first um sit with them first sit with the people with lived expertise first and we're always happy to be a part of that conversation um but we are just one piece of a very complicated puzzle That was an incredibly gracious and thoughtful answer, as all of your answers have been. Um, our next question is, how might a system that facilitates voting for homeless people be structured? And we have one question after this one. Well, I think that the, the biggest challenge has always been the address. Um, you know, I've worked with Secretary of States around the country and so uh, that's something that we have to work through. Uh, we use addresses for uh, folks uh, who are homeless uh, uh, to receive mail. Uh, let's say in Baltimore, healthcare for the homeless is one agency that provides that. And so we just have to ensure uh, that there's a policy that's set up that uh, will allow that person, even though they're not housed, uh, to be able to use that address uh, within the state's voting system. Uh, and uh, I think that's doable. I think it's something that can be argued successfully. Um, and, and we're dealing with such a fight as it relates to voter participation, uh, black suffrage in particular. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just so disappointed in, in so many uh, conservatives who uh, are really pushing this disenfranchisement, uh, 21st century poll taxes uh, that really sparks, um, you know, just some sad commentary of, of moving us so far back. Uh, but I think that those are sensible solutions that if a person does not have a, a, a stable domicile, that they can still participate uh, if we uh, utilize the same thing that we use for them for for other um, 
uh, situations by using a, a stationary address. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I know our partners at LA Community Action Network are deeply engaged in that, and we're very interested in, um, you know, making sure that all of our residents understand their enfranchisement and they're engaged and, and use their voices. I have um, a final question from Tiffany, and it is, in working to dismantle white supremacy, what advice would you give to service providers who are met with resistance from leadership when calling out the racist policies and structures that are in place? Amanda, why don't you take this one? I don't know if it's fair for me to take this one. Hi, Tiffany. Tiffany is one of my dear colleagues and mentees, and it's so good to see your, your words in the chat box. Um, this is a tough one uh, because it's very real. You know, I hear this from folks all the time, as I said, that they've, they've been seeing this in their organization, in their community, and they're trying to dismantle it. I think we are seeing the power of organizing right now. And so I would say learn from the movement. Learn from movements who don't have established power. You know, the folks out on the, the voices out on the street that are not elected officials, they're not the, they could be, but they're primarily not CEOs of organizations. They have organized and caucused and pushed within the, the streets, their organization um, to get attention to what's really happening. And I think we can learn an incredible amount from organizers, from community organizers, from people who work to develop power in different ways within our institutions to push leadership to change. Um, to start with things like data, to start start with things like history. Um, and I do think philanthropy plays a role in using their power to push organizations and communities to start this, to do this work as well. But I think there's real power in caucusing together. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jeff, because maybe he has a, a better answer than I do. I think Tiffany's question about what advice would we have? Uh, one piece of advice uh, is to expect resistance uh, and don't be surprised by it. Uh, even even the most uh, well-meaning white liberals are often the ones standing in the way of racial progress, and that's that's been true. Dr. King talked about that uh, a long time ago. Um, the other piece of advice I would have is to do this in solidarity with one another, white allies and people of color. I think uh, folks of color, when they stand out uh, publicly within their organizations and challenge uh, white supremacy, challenge colorblindness, challenge uh, race neutrality, which is not a, a real thing, uh, Ibram Kendi tells us. But uh, you, you do it together. You do it with the white allies in the organization because people of color are really putting something at risk when they step out in a way that their white colleagues simply aren't. And where I found a lot of my voice in this movement is uh, as a white person, you know, often with some power, often with an organization I'm running or staff behind me or even within a team where I'm not the boss, um, I can say all kinds of stuff. I can get away with being pretty anti-authoritarian and challenging things uh, in a way that my black colleagues uh, can't do with the, with the same kind of safety and security that I can. So when, when we talk about using your white privilege, that's some of what we're talking about. I've also found that when you do this shoulder to shoulder with a multiracial team or pair or group that's challenging things over and over and asking questions of the data and raising it relentlessly, um, you can wear down uh, you can wear down leadership resistance. I think I'm seeing that begin to happen across the homelessness field. But we've seen tremendous resistance among white executive leaders, among white boards. Um, I think we have a whole other set of advice for them. But for you who are uh, further down in an organizational hierarchy, keep at it, prepare yourself, expect resistance, do it in solidarity with one another. And if I could just add to what. My phenomenal colleagues have uh, already stated. Uh, one of my uh, uh, mentors is Andrew Young, uh, Ambassador Young, uh, Lieutenant of Martin Luther King. And one of the things he always reminds us of, Jeff, is that there's nothing that was achieved in the civil rights movement without good white people. And that is something that 
has resonated with me when we talk about allyship. Uh, I'm certainly one who was kind of reared by Pan-Africanists. I certainly believe that we need to uh, certainly work to be masters of our destiny, but you're going to need partners. Jeff laid it out so succinctly. There is a liberty that he has that oftentimes we do not have. And then oftentimes in these organizations, we are on the lower rung. So when we speak out, uh, we're penalized, uh, folks are losing uh, jobs and subsequently that whole financial uh, 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 downturn happens for us because we've lost our job for speaking out. I would also say uh, to, uh, you know, uh, incorporate what Amanda talked about, data tells a story. So we can't come anecdotally. It is not an emotional argument. We want to come with the data. But then also I think it's important that we not only have our white allies and others within uh, that organization, we need to find external partners uh, who can put the pressure on these organizations in a way that perhaps you cannot do internally. Hi, everybody. This is Jet. Apparently, a night of technical difficulties. I'm having audio trouble now, too. You still with us, Jet? In any case, sorry for the delay. I would really like to bring on our Chief Executive Officer, Lee Ragus, and it would be great, Antonio and Jeff and John and Amanda, if you could all stay on screen. She's so excited to thank you for such a wonderful evening, and so am I. This was just fantastic. You were all amazing. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, I first want to extend my gratitude and thanks to you, Antonio, leading an awesome panel. Um, deep reverence and, and gratitude to you, Jeff, John, and Amanda. And Amanda, I'm so happy <laughs> we got to hear your voice. You know, that was, um, it was a real honor for me to sit and listen along with the audience, which comprises of our partners, our residents, our employees so that we could listen and learn and really absorb some of the things and actions we need to take moving forward. I think a lot of you already know that um, over the last 30 years, the trust has really prided themselves on having the courage to fight, you know, on behalf of homelessness, on behalf of racism. You know, um, I also believe that in the last 30 days, it has been frustrating and heartbreaking and enlightening to know that we have more work to do. We have to fight harder, advocate louder, and continue to be an advocate and a conduit for our lived experts, both in our resident population, our community, and the neighbors that are around our properties. So we have very attentively listened to what we need to do. I was very um, excited and honored to hear some of your guidance points because we do want to take them and incorporate them on some of the actions that we're doing moving forward. You know, we are expanding our trauma-informed care training to all of our employees, not just the ones in the field, not just our case managers and our property managers, but everyone that works with us, everyone that partners with us. We are definitely um, continuing to expand our diversity and equity practices across the organization from our employees to our partners to our board and specifically partnering with organizations and individuals like you so that we're being held accountable so that we're moving the actions forward. Some of the things that you also um, pointed out is being transparent with the metrics and calling action to the metrics that we have and sharing that with everyone, holding ourselves accountable, holding our partners accountable, holding our actions accountable. And um, again, just wrapping it up, just saying it one more time, is continuing to provide the voice um, and the 
conduit and the mechanism so that our lived experts, our residents, our community has the ability to change the policy, both with data and metrics and their stories and their experiences around homelessness and racism and all of the inequities. I can see you. I don't know if you can see me because I can't okay. see you. We can see you. Oh, that's good. So I don't know if I'm on the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen. You're, I'm great. Great. You're like, fantastic. Okay, awesome. Well, I like, really am grateful for this. We converted from a weekly meeting to a monthly meeting. And it was important for us to make sure that we shared your perspective with everyone to say, these are who we are listening to. These are who we are partnering with. These are the actions we're going to be taking. You know, these are the experts in the field, you know. So um, thank you for coming on, you know, on behalf of the organization, on behalf of our residents, on behalf of our board. You know, your voice lends credibility, you know, to some of the, the fight that we continue to do on a daily basis. We look forward to a continued partnership. And again, very, very grateful for you coming on and sharing your experiences, your perspective um, with all of our audiences and anyone, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be listening to this recording, you know, kind of moving forward in, in LA and beyond. So um, again, thank you very much for taking the time. We, I know we went way over and I know that our audience is very engaged. So appreciate it. Antonio, Jeff, John, Amanda, you're beautiful. You're awesome. And we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.